So I'm Louis Rosenberg uh, here today to talk about swarm AI and its use uh, to detect deceit in human faces. And um, just a quick outline of what I'll talk through because I know a lot of this is the first time uh, most of you have seen this type of technology. So I will, I will start off just giving some background about what is artificial swarm intelligence or, or swarm AI. And I will talk about really the core concept, which is to amplify the intelligence of human groups by allowing them to work together in swarms, modeled after swarms in nature and, and moderated by, by AI algorithms. And so I'll, I'll quickly kind of go through what the core concept is, and I'll talk about the typical applications, which is predictions and forecasts. And if you've seen anything about swarm AI in the past, you've, you've probably seen some of the predictions uh, that has been done by, by aggregating groups of people as swarms. Uh, while that's really interesting, uh, recently we started wondering, well, what about other forms of intelligence, like social intelligence? And so I'll talk uh, about a, a recent study that we, we just completed where uh, we're assessing deceit in, uh, in human facial expressions, where the idea being, uh, can we evaluate smiles? So the, uh, people, turns out people are actually pretty poor at evaluating smiles to know if a smile is authentic or deceitful. And so we did a study to see, well, how do individuals compare to, to swarms, to a swarm AI system uh, driven by people in evaluating uh, human smiles. So uh, let me start off with just some background about, uh, about swarm AI. And if you've heard anything about this type of technology, uh, you might have heard uh, some things in the press uh, at, at Unanimous. So I, I should mention, I'm, I'm from Unanimous AI. Uh, this project we, we did uh, in collaboration with some researchers at Oxford. And uh, this is a, this, so here is a study that we did, or, or a, a project that we did uh, in, as a response to a challenge from uh, CBS Interactive last year, where they asked us to predict the Kentucky Derby. And, and so at Unanimous AI, we, we didn't know anything about horse racing, uh, but they asked us to predict the Kentucky Derby uh, last year, and not just the winner, but the first four horses in order. And in horse racing, that's called the superfecta, and last year it went off at 540 to one odds. Uh, and so what we did to, to make this prediction is we, we got together a group of people. In this case, they were uh, a group of real people, not experts, amateur or enthusiast uh, horse racing uh, enthusiasts, and we had them connect online, uh, moderated by our swarm intelligence algorithms, to, to form this amplified intelligence where they can predict together as a system. And, uh, and we generated a set of predictions for CBS Interactive. We gave the predictions of the first four horses in order to the reporter, and then uh, the reporter actually went to the Kentucky Derby. Oh, I should mention that. Uh, this, this process of, of taking real people and connecting them in real time uh, with swarm algorithms is what we generally refer to as artificial swarm intelligence or, or swarm AI. And, uh, and so, again, we, we gave the predictions to the reporter, and she actually went to the Kentucky Derby, and she, she placed a bet on the Superfecta, and she tweeted out her ticket, which put a lot of pressure on us, uh, because now... Uh, this prediction was out there. And, and if, if you've heard about this story, it's because uh, the, the prediction ended up being perfect. And so anyone who had placed a $20 bet on that set of predictions uh, would have won $11,000. Uh, and I fortunately placed a $20 bet, and I won $11,000. The reporter placed a bet. A, a bunch of her readers placed bets. In fact, one of her readers reported winning $50,000, uh, which uh, is, you know, is a great result for us. And, and of course, there's always luck involved in, in anything. We do a lot of predicting sports this way, and there's always luck involved. Uh, but in this case, what's actually more interesting to us as researchers than the final result is when we look at those 20 people who came together in a swarm to make this prediction. And what was, what was interesting here was that um, as individuals, not a single one of those 20 people got all four horses correct. Uh, and we have them make the predictions first as individuals before they come together as a swarm so we can look at a, a baseline of how, um, of how the swarm is amplifying intelligence. So in this case, none of them got all four horses correct on their own. And if they'd just taken a vote, a traditional kind of wisdom of crowds method, they would have gotten one horse right out of the four. But when they came together as a swarm and, and predicted uh, as a system, uh, they were perfect. And that's ultimately the power of, of swarm intelligence or in the systems that we create, an, an artificial swarm intelligence. And so what is swarm AI? And the way, uh, the way it's generally defined is we, we, we take a real-time human population, and that population has in it 
knowledge and wisdom and insights and intuition. It, it has uh, a lot more uh, intangible information in it than we, than we give it credit for. And, and we take this real-time human population and we basically turn it into an artificial expert that we can ask questions to. And by taking this artificial expert, we can make more accurate predictions and decisions and evaluations and forecasts than we could have done with those individuals on their own. And, and the magic is that is the swarm intelligence algorithms that aggregates these people in real time. And so, so what is swarm intelligence? Uh, and it, it comes from nature. And so this was in, basically inspired by how natural systems amplify the intelligence of groups. And so you know, nature, over millions and millions of years, has evolved methods of amplifying the intelligence of groups to make optimized decisions. What nature doesn't do is it doesn't take polls, it doesn't conduct surveys, it doesn't run focus groups, it doesn't use SurveyMonkey, it, it also doesn't do, uh, collect big bits of, of historical data and, and do big data analysis. W what nature does to, to harness the knowledge and wisdom and instincts of a large population is form systems, real-time systems where the group can think together as a system with feedback loops to converge together on optimal solutions. And this is ultimately uh, one of the primary reasons that birds flock and fish school and bees swarm is that they are smarter together than alone. So let me give you a biological example so you can appreciate how smart nature is in amplifying the intelligence of groups. And so the, the most studied example in nature is, is bee swarms. And so this is a bee swarm, it's about 10,000 bees, and they have a really, really difficult and important problem to solve. These 10,000 bees need to find a new home to move into. And that, that new home could be a hole in a, a hollow log, a hole in the side of a building. Uh, it could be a, a hole in your garage, which happened to me. And, um, and so this maybe doesn't sound like a difficult decision, but it's actually a life or death decision that can impact the survival of this colony for generations. And so this life or death decision, and to solve this problem, what, what these bees do is they, they first send out scout bees. They send out hundreds of scout bees that actually search a 30 square mile area of uh, a 30 square mile area and find candidate sites. So this is data collection. They go out into the world, they collect data, and they find dozens of candidate sites to move into. And that's actually the easy part. The hard part is that they then need to pick the best possible solution from all the options that they've discovered. And the, the survival of their colony depends on this. Problem is that this is actually a very difficult, uh, a very difficult problem to solve. It's actually a complex multivariable problem because honeybees are very discriminating. So they need to find a home out there in the world that's large enough to store the honey they need for the winter, that's ventilated well enough to stay cool in the summer, that's insulated well enough to stay warm in the winter. It has to have an entrance that's small enough to block predators, but big enough to allow bee traffic to go in and out. It has to be waterproof so it's protected from the rain. Um, it has to be near water for bees to drink. And of course, it needs to be well located near lots of good sources of pollen. So this is a complex multivariable problem. It's, it's very difficult to solve. And a single bee, which has a tiny brain, less than a million neurons, you, you have 85 billion neurons. So however smart you are, divide that by 85,000, and that's, that's a, a bee. Uh, a single bee certainly could not comprehend this complex multivariable problem. And in fact, if you were a human CEO trying to find the perfect location for a new factory, you'd face a similarly complex problem. Uh, with lots of competing constraints, it would be very difficult to solve. And yet biologists have shown that honeybees solve this problem optimally 80% of the time. And if they don't find the optimal solution, they generally find the next optimal solution. So the question is, well, how do honeybees do this? How do they find this optimal solution? And the answer is they form a system, a real-time system that takes in as input noisy data collected by all these scout bees, processes that data, and gives out optimal solutions. And, and they're processing this data as a system. And I know what you're thinking, they're honeybees, how do they process data? It's actually remarkable that they actually process data. What, what these bees do is they actually vibrate their bodies. And biologists call this a waggle dance because to, to people, it looks like the bees are dancing. But really, they're generating signals that represent their support for the various home sites that are under consideration. And by combining these signals, they basically engage in this multi-directional tug of war, pushing and pulling on the problem until they converge on the one solution that they can best agree upon. And it's almost always the optimal solution. And so the big question that, that we faced uh, a few years ago when we started working on, on these problems was can, can humans do this? If birds and bees and fish can optimize uh, their, their intelligence by forming real-time systems, can, can people do it? And so we started uh, looking at this from a, a design problem. We said, well, 
we need to empower groups of people to, to connect in real time from anywhere in synchrony. Real time system with feedback loops so that they can explore options and converge on the solutions that they can best agree upon. And what we really were, import, were, were, were interested in is making sure that people, as they participated in these systems, could be as expressive as bees are in, in a, a bee swarm, or birds or fish. All these other species have methods of, of expressing not just the, the opinion that they, that, that they think is the best, but also the magnitude, the changing magnitudes of their opinions. And so uh, we developed this system, uh, or we knew we had to develop this system that can allow these same types of, uh, of vectors of opinions that, that other species had enabled, and we had to be able to implement algorithms in the background that, could, that can basically watch these behaviors and, and combine and aggregate opinions in an optimal way. Uh, the, the biggest challenge we had in trying to model these systems after biological systems is that, that people can't waggle dance. And so uh, what we had to do was come up with uh, a, a, a method of enabling people to form these systems. And so we studied natural swarms, and we developed the algorithms and interfaces to allow humans to form similar swarms online. And so this is a natural swarm, and that's an artificial swarm. And so that artificial swarm uh, is actually, actually about 100 people, and they're all working together in real time. And each of the little magnets that you see is controlled by a person, logged in from anywhere in the world. And, uh, and they're, by varying their opinions in real time, they're pushing and pulling on the system in, in much the same way that bees do by waggle dancing. And, and it's, a, it's an unusual interface, but the important thing is that the interface had to be expressive. And so when, when people control these magnets, and they do it either with a touch screen or a mouse or, or on their phone, when they control these magnets, they can vary the, both the, the direction and the distance. So they're controlling the magnitude and uh, the magnitude of their, of their choice and the level of conviction they have in wanting to, to pull the whole swarm in a certain direction. And so once we had this interface, uh, we, we built this uh, cloud-based platform that allowed peop allows people to log in and we can ask questions to, to large groups of people and have them answer as a swarm and make predictions and forecasts. And so uh, this is what the, the interface looks like and people can chat so we can, uh, we can give them information and, and prepare them for questions. And then we can ask questions and then, when, uh, and then there's an area where people swarm. And so what would happen, for example, uh, is that we can type in a question, who will win the Super Bowl, and we can give a set of choices. And then that question appears on everybody's screen at the exact same time. So it could be 200 people, all part of the same swarm. And every single one of those individuals has control of their own little magnet, where they can control the magnitude and direction of their input in real time as part of a system. And so what it looks like, so here's a, here's a prediction we did uh, also for CBS last year. We were, they were asked to predict who would be the Republican nominee for president of the US. And so here we had uh, a group of people. And you can see that they all logged in, and they're pushing and pulling, and they're converging on the one solution that they can best agree upon. And in this case, their prediction was Donald Trump, which turned out to be a correct prediction. Uh, and what was interesting about this at, at the time was that the, the polls at this, at this point in the, in the primary process were actually not saying Donald Trump. They, they were saying, actually saying Marco Rubio. And so you can ask the question, well, why does a poll and a swarm come up with different answers? And in this case, the, the poll was, was incorrect. Well, one of the cool things about a swarm is we collect a massive amount of data. We know exactly how every single one of those people is behaving in real time during, during the system. And we can look at that data in a lot of interesting ways. And so this, here we're looking at the, uh, what we call faction analysis. We're looking at different factions of people pulling in different directions. And so what you can see here is that there are three primary factions, these three different colors, the, the orange and the green and the, and the purple. And the, the, at time zero, the biggest faction was actually Marco Rubio. Had you taken a vote, people would have said, oh, the biggest plurality is Marco Rubio. He's going to be the next uh, Republican nominee for president. But when you allow the group to actually uh, form a system and find the solution that they can best agree upon, rather than just the largest plurality. In this case, the green area, which was Donald Trump, is where they converged and they made this prediction that was significantly more accurate than they would have done in a, you know, a traditional poll or, or wisdom of crowds method. The other cool thing is that because we have all this data about how people are behaving in these systems, we can look at it in a variety of ways. We can look at how people actually switched between factions. So we can see, well, which, which types of people were entrenched in certain options, which types of people were flexible, and we can actually make, get deeper insights into how, uh, not, just, not just what the optimal solution was, but why did the group converge on it the way that it did. And so that uh, brings me now to this, this research study that we recently 
uh, did where we looked at social intelligence. And, and as I mentioned, there's lots of research that, that uh, we've done over the last few years on predictions and, and predictive intelligence, but social intelligence is a new, really a new topic for us. And so we want to see, well, can a swarm amplify that type of intelligence in a human population? And we looked at detecting deceit in human faces. And, uh, and specifically, we looked at can, you know, what if we ask, can you, can you determine if, if a smile is authentic or forced? And so uh, this is a, basically a subjective judgment task. And what we did is we, we had 20 videos of, of people smiling. Uh, some of those smiles were authentic smiles, meaning that they were inspired by an actual emotional response. And some of those smiles were, were forced. People just generated those smiles on command. And the question is, can you discriminate the two? And, um, and so these are examples of what those look like. And so it, uh, you know, these, these look like pretty normal smiles. But it, it turns out that the, uh, this first smile is authentic, and this second smile is forced. And it's actually difficult to tell the difference. And there's actually a, a wide body of, of uh, historical research on, on these type of smile discriminations. And, uh, and what our interest was was to compare how do individuals do on making this assessment, real smile versus four smile, versus a, an artificial swarm that takes input from real people combined uh, by intelligence algorithms and, and converges on a solution. And uh, in the historical research showed that human error rate was 33% in these, these types of assessments, which, which is, is kind of low. Uh, two out of, you know, one out of every three times, people make an incorrect ass assessment in determining if a smile is real or deceitful. So people are easily deceived by a smile. And so in this study, we had, uh, we had 168 uh, human subjects, participants who first responded as uh, in a standard survey to assess smiles and give us their feedback. And then we had them form swarms, online swarms uh, connected you know, remotely, uh, groups of 30 to 35 people. So we had these five online swarms. And, uh, and this is what it looks like uh, with a swarm where First, a, a video would pop up. They'd watch the smiling person video. And then as a swarm, they would converge on an assessment, real or fake smile. And, um, and here you can see what, what it looks like with this particular swarm converging on an answer. Uh, for, for this particular video, they said it was a, a fake smile and actually had high confidence in, in that fake smile. So how did the swarm do compared to the individuals? If we look at the results, uh, across these 168 people, broken into five trials, on average, out of the 20, 20 uh, assessments, uh, the average was 6.6 uh, you know, .6 errors out of 20, which was a 33% error rate. So actually, the, the test conf conformed to historical research really, really nicely when just looking at individuals. Then when we, we had groups of, uh, of 30 to 35 people work as swarms, making the same assessments, uh, the error dropped to 18%. So they were Almost, almost half the number of errors. They dropped the error rate to, by 46% while thinking together as a swarm, uh, at converging on their, the, their optimal decision. And so we were, uh, we were uh, really pleased to see these results. And we, we did uh, a variety of different analysis on, on the data. Uh, this, we did a bootstrap analysis to really look to see uh, how, how repeatable these results were. And uh, if found a, a p-value of basically 1%. And so we felt really confident about these particular results. And so ultimately, in conclusion, what we found from this study of, of smiles was that uh, swarming uh, did, predict the, did increase the predictive accuracy of this social intelligence task, which is showing similar results that, to, to what has been seen in prior studies on predictive tasks. Uh, by swarming, humans went from 33% error rate to 18%. Um, it wasn't a typical wisdom of crowd effect. We actually compared this also with just uh, a standard vote. A standard vote actually didn't show uh, statistically significant benefit over uh, individuals what, where the swarm was uh, very significant. And as far as future work on, on these types of swarm systems, the things that, uh, that we're working on now is really looking at the size of swarms and how does that affect the accuracy. These were swarms of 35 people. We're looking at you know, swarms of 100 people, 200 people, and, and, look, and really assessing how, how big, you know, how does size impact uh, the accuracy of swarms. Uh, an interesting point here is that honeybees, while they have 10,000 bees in a colony, when they make optimal decisions, they usually only use three to 500 bees. And so there probably is uh, a, a very clear diminishing returns in terms of the, the size of a population, because evolution did not use all 10,000 bees. 
uh, it, to, to get uh, the most efficient answers possible. Uh, and we're also uh, have been optimizing uh, the, the swarm intelligence algorithms that, that are modeled after natural swarms uh, by uh, using machine learning and other methods that, that have uh, continued to increase the accuracy of how, how we aggregate uh, the real-time opinions. So that's, uh, that's swarm intelligence and its use in uh, determining deceit. Thanks. Thank you so much.